Good morning here, good afternoon in Asia, and good night elsewhere. <coughs> First of all, it's a privilege to be asked to start the ball rolling on this really important meeting. The topic and the title uh, is, for me, really challenging. And I've been involved in this area for some years. I deliberately chose controversial titles, both in the terms of this presentation and in terms of the editorial I was invited to produce for this important international health uh, series. Now, I'm going to start by referring you back to what I consider the Bible on eradication of diseases by Walter Dowdle and Don Hopkins, which was published in the late 1990s. And in this book, you can see what the criteria are for the definition and the aspiration of eradication. This followed, of course, the successful eradication of smallpox, which is, I have to remind you, is the only successful eradication uh, that has been achieved by the public health community. The failures include yellow fever, malaria, and yours. Now, Don Hopkins, in this book, identified 10 criteria which needed to be addressed if you were considering eradication. Some of them include understanding the natural history of the organism you're dealing with, wide consultation before you embark on a programme, the importance of surveillance, the requisite vertical approach for the target infection, being open-minded and aware that you're going to face challenges of various sorts and expect the unexpected. What I believe also, really importantly, is that you need strong advocacy, not necessarily from scientists but from politicians, as demonstrated by the uh, exceptional advocacy, advocacy of Jimmy Carter. Amongst other things, the Disease Eradication Task Force, which was the result of that publication, identified six diseases which they considered to be eradicable. And in the mid 2000, with Don Hopkins and Nevio Zagaria, I wrote this paper which emphasised the need for accurate and consistent usage of the terminology of eradication, elimination and control. The six diseases which the task force in the early 1990s considered were eradicable were guinea worm, trachunculiasis, polio, cystosicosis, rubella, lymphatic filariasis and mumps. That may have changed over the last decade or so, but this was the basis for the furthering of certainly the guinea worm and the polio eradication programmes. This has not come up too well, but just want to emphasise the eradication terminology and definition. And I think you should frame this meeting along these lines. Permanent reduction to zero worldwide incidence of infection caused by a specific agent as a result of deliberate efforts. Intervention measures are no longer required. I do want to emphasise global and infection, not disease. Those are addressed in the definitions of elimination of disease and infection uh, which are listed above. But you can get that from WHO publications and other literature. But WHO in its excellent reports on neglected tropical diseases have used those terms in their publications. But within a month of those publications the weekly epidemiological record used exactly the wrong terminology, the eradication of yours in India. It should have been elimination of yours in India because eradication is global and must be certified by a formal commission and a formal process. 
Now I'm going to use a few examples which I have some experience with about the problems and challenges of eradication. First of all, guinea worm. This is the slide from WHO sources and Dirk Engels is here and can supplement the most up-to-date information. But this was 2014. Numbers of reported cases in four <coughs> countries were 126. The information we have uh, this, up to this time of year, I think, is less than about 20 so far this year in four countries. I'll discuss those four countries. But I was in part of the certification team which visited Nigeria. And one of the really important things about the Nigeria experience of guinea worm is that it got down from 680,000 cases in 1988 to zero cases 20 years later. The biggest, most populous country in Africa in 6,000 villages across the spectrum of the ecologies in Nigeria. That was a huge public health success. It was due to many factors. But like many of the diseases we're going to be talking about, sensitization of the population and the reward system in Nigeria was critical. It associated with a really effective surveillance procedure, which involved the guinea worm eradication program as well. So these experiences are important in terms of us being able to move forward. Now in Guinea worm, our trajectory has been somewhat derailed by what has been described by Mark Eberhard and colleagues in Chad as a peculiar epidemiology. Up to four years ago, we had no idea that dogs would be involved in the cycle in Africa. Some 15 countries had been certified free of guinea worm transmission uh, in Africa and there had never been a sighting or a case reported in dogs. Mark Eberhard's search of the literature suggests that the last record of that was in uh, Uzbekistan in 1932. But suddenly dogs became evident and you can see here um, I'm not sure what I'm going to touch, but bottom right, an emerging, classic guinea worm emerging from a dog. Initially, small numbers of dogs were found to be infected, but up to date this year, 2015, the numbers that have been detected of guinea worm cases in dogs are approaching, if not in excess, of 400. Whilst there have been only seven human cases. And those human cases are scattered, as you see from the 19, this is 2015 figures, the yellow tri uh, squares are human cases. They do not fit the epidemiology we know of infection in Chad. The worrying thing about the Chad situation, accepting there may be an entirely different life cycle involving a paratenic host in the fish, um, associated with the fishing of the lagoons in the Chari River as the water levels decline, um, there is something strange happening here. If 400 cases of dog guinea worm were discovered by August, the rate of increase in the dog population of this infection is extremely concerning. What we do about it, we don't know. But for me, the worrying thing is the cases on close to the human cases close to the border with the RCA, Republic Centrafricain, because that country has already been certified free of transmission. And you'll see the numbers of dog cases in blue coming down the river system. Another problem we face, and this relates to Nigeria, during the ICT mission to Nigeria two years ago, Boko Haram in the northeast of Nigeria, shot 30 children and burnt down the school. We know the story of Boko Haram, which dominates that area. We were only able to verify transmission had stopped in the northeast of Nigeria in that very narrow window of opportunity because we had some brave people from Nigerian uh, NGOs who were prepared to go into Bornu under the radar screen. UN people cannot go to these areas now. 
and three people have been killed in the last year working on guinea worm missions in Niger and more recently too in Sudan. So guinea worm with the endemic countries Mali, Chad, South Sudan and Ethiopia face, we face a challenge. We have dramatically reduced the numbers of cases. But as in all eradications, the last mile is the big challenge and the emergence of the dogs in Chad pose a significant problem in terms of the definition of eradication. Zero global incidence of infection, Dracunculus medinensis. Not just in humans, doesn't specify whether it's in dogs or humans or whatever. We also know in Chad that a wild carnivore has been detected with a guinea worm. I'll leave you that question mark hanging over the term eradication in the context of guinea worm as we face it now. But Mali has endemic areas in insecure parts of northern and eastern Mali. Chad presents its peculiar epidemiology. South Sudan is actually going to be successful. There's been a fantastic decline in numbers in South Sudan despite the civil unrest. And in Ethiopia we have an isolated area or in Gambella where whilst there are one or two cases still, we have had dogs and baboons seen to be infected. Now, guinea worm program <coughs> needs to launch, like smallpox did in the 1970s, a global reward. And this is the smallpox poster. And we will need for the guinea worm eradication program a global reward for reporting any new case. Now I want to track back to a bit of history, Iceland. Now this is a journal which you're all familiar with, the International Journal of Osteoarchaeology. <laughs> Up to date, 2010, cases of hydatid disease in medieval Iceland. Um, these are the hydatid cysts, and you see in the arrow in the bottom right, a hydatid cyst in a corpse excav excavated in a monastery in Iceland in, uh, recently, uh, dating back to about 1300, 1400. If you want to know what Iceland was like when the first elimination program was started by a Danish vet, Dr. Harold Krabber, you need to read Burial Rites by Hannah Kent, which describes the situation of the novel The Last Execution of a Female Icelander for Murder in 1830. Fantastic book, but it sets the scene of rural Iceland. And this is the, the two documents, Harold Krabber, how you eliminate, and I'm using the word correctly, a disease and infection from an island. Reviewed by Johansson. Now, your Icelandic is probably worse than mine, but the point about this document on the left of your screen was that Krabber circulated this to all the communities in Iceland, which was a highly literate society and could only read the Bible and the Icelandic sagas. So when they got a document on something else, they read it avidly. And that was the basis for sensitising the population of Iceland <coughs> to remove hydatid disease using purging dogs, uh, appropriate use uh, and destruction of sheep carcasses and health education. But that process took 25 to 30 years to get hydatid disease down to zero cases. Now the point about that was it was not endemic in Iceland until dogs were moved into Iceland by the Germans in about 1300, and hence the hydatid cysts in those excavated corpses. I want to move on to onchocerciasis. At the end of this year, two of the most successful public health programmes, and Adrian Hopkins will talk about them, will stop. But I want to emphasise what the original objectives of those programmes were. The Onchocerciasis Control Programme in West Africa was the control of Onchocerciasis as a problem of public health importance. 
and as an impediment to socio-economic development. The APOC program, which followed it in 1995, the control of onchocerciasis to a point where it is no longer a disease of public health importance. And then in the Americas, the objective was the regional elimination, the correct term, of onchocerciasis. And since over a 25-year period, using twice a year ivermectin, Colombia, Ecuador and Mexico have been verified free of transmission. In West Africa, onchocerciasis left devastation like this, abandoned villages on the rivers. This is a slide taken by an old colleague, David Baldry, of a village just outside Ouagadougou. And David is talking to them on the left of the picture. Not a single adult male in this picture had sight. Forty years later, nobody in West Africa is going to go blind or get skin disease from onchocerciasis. Whilst there may be microfilaria circulating still in a few residual foci, the disease has been controlled as a disease of public health importance throughout that continent, that part of the continent, and it will continue to be so. The last microfilaria may not have gone, and it was based initially on helicopter spraying, but then on ivermectin. And those are the achievements, and they're published in many um, journals of the onchocerciasis control programs, and they are something to celebrate. We may not have seen the last microfilaria, but actually does that matter? Because nobody is going to go blind or get skin disease. But the scenario and paradigm changed when the paper in Mali demonstrated, from Mali dem and Senegal, demonstrated that you could achieve elimination <coughs> using ivermectin alone. So the program changed not from the control and sustainability of ivermectin and controlling public health importance, but to elimination of onco on the continent of Africa. The question, and I think Adrian might address it, did we set the bar too high? In the Americas, we see that there's been a successful program based on ivermectin alone, and as I've said, Mexico, Ecuador, and Colombia have had the absence of transmission verified. The problem lies down on the Venezuelan-Brazilian border, where suddenly, and this is the problem of access, five thousand Yamamami have been discovered in the endemic area. Now, these are communities which are remote, very difficult to access, and therefore very difficult to give ivermectin on a regular basis because they move around, they're in a cross-border focus, and they are really out of contact with any health service. So that is one of the issues we really have to address. Now, I'm coming to the end, but the final point I want to make, and this is the island of Bioko, where onchocerciasis was a significant public health problem, but where, with ivermectin on the one hand, and then aerial spraying of the breeding sites <coughs> of a particular vector species, the Bioko form of Simulium yehensi, which is genetically different from the mainland yehensi, this organism, this fly, has been made extinct. It doesn't exist on the planet anymore. That was the situation that was the aspiration of the smallpox program and actually is the aspiration of the guinea worm program had we not found guinea worm in the dogs. So there is a distinction between extinction, eradication and elimination. So my take home message is, is <coughs> please Use the terminology correctly. Eradication is zero global incidence of an infectious agent, not a disease. Therefore, this is controversial, you cannot eradicate malaria. You either eradicate falciparum, vivax, nolzai, etc. So if you're going to target eradication of a malaria organism, you better decide which one you take. So I believe anything that says eradication of malaria is terminologically incorrect. 
This is a long-term commitment. The ONCO programme, achieving public health elimination, has been 40 years. Iceland took the same sort of time, as did New Zealand and Tasmania and Cyprus, to get rid of hydatid disease. Elimination is a regional or geographic context. WHO are seeking to eliminate dog-mediated rabies transmission in the Americas, for example. We've seen the geographic context in terms of islands, and I think you need to expect surprises. We have the biological surprise of the dogs. We have the socio-geographic discovery of unknown Yamamami communities. We have issues around political commitment and resource constraints, but we have conflict issues. Many of the areas where we will need to certify the eradication or the cessation of transmission of guinea worm are not currently accessible if you're anything to do with the United Nations. And there's a swathe of conflict across North Africa through to Pakistan, as we see for the polio eradication problems in Pakistan, through uh, the northern parts of the Sahel, from Mali through to Somalia. Islands are easy to eradicate or eliminate from. WHO leadership is critical, partnerships, alliance and advocacy essential. In parallel with operational and implementation essential research. Research is essential, but it has to be directed within the context of the programme. Ong Sakas' programme succeeded because a significant budget was allocated to operational implementation research. And as I think Laura Dean will say this afternoon, don't expect magic bullets. They take a long time to fire and come to fruition. Now, thank you for the opportunity of talking to you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, various people who contributed to the slides, and Mark Eberhard and Frank Richards, and um, I wish the uh, rest of the day well in discussing what I consider a really important issue and one which will engage the public health community for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you.